Okay, welcome to the final session of our marathon on the association uh, agreements. Thank you very much for those who stayed with us for the third day in running, and also for those who have returned for this session. It's my pleasure to chair the final session. It's going to be a short and sort of hopefully intensive and energetic session. And, uh, but if you think that you can relax, please don't because uh, there will, uh, we would like you to do a bit of multitasking while listening, also to reflect on what we've talked about, about the association forum format and your feedback. What has worked, what could be improved, your basically suggestions for the future. So the panel is about the future of the associated countries within the Eastern Partnership, but also for us a bit of homework in terms of actually how can we work together in the future in terms of having this kind of a discussion. So it's my great pleasure to, uh, perhaps less is more on this occasion, our gender balance has collapsed slightly because I'm afraid Svetlana Zalishchuk cannot join us, but we have two sort of parliamentary turbo team, if I can put it this way, and it seems the catchy word at the moment in terms of how uh, the Ukrainian government seems to be working. We will be looking at the political vision. We've talked a lot, uh, so sort of moving between the two levels, technical and political, but the challenge we all have and with, with which we grapple is how to work within sort of, uh, how to combine the trio, sort of the, the three associated countries, how to work together within the Eastern Partnership format. And perhaps a bit of reflection, what it means for the Eastern Partnership and how, even within the European Parliament, this is feasible. We know, for example, for, uh, that within COEST, uh, there is a working group on the association um, agreements, and yet it's called ad hoc. The European Parliament has not agreed to make it a permanent sort of forum within the COEST for the sake of maintaining the unity within the Eastern Partnership. So there, are, there is plenty of work for us to do and we are very well positioned here to uh, consider those issues. We have two uh, parliamentary sort of um, speakers here. The Deputy Speaker of the Parliament of the Republic of Moldova, Mr. Popsoy, and Andrius Kubilius, um, who doesn't really need an introduction, but um, I'm delighted to see that he's also now the, um, apart from being the former Prime Minister and now the member of the European Parliament, also the co-chair of the um, Euronest. So it's very, very important to have someone so knowledgeable and experienced in this position because the European Parliament is perhaps a surprising foreign policy success story in terms of actually developing a very active role in uh, promoting sort of cooperation and integration with the associated countries. So as I promised, it will be a short session, uh, perhaps seven to 10 minutes maximum for you, if I could ask, and please keep it sort of forward looking, but also re bearing in mind that people here are very knowledgeable about our topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, allow me first to start uh, with the perspective of how Eastern Partnership is perceived within these countries and particularly within Moldova. From its start in 2009, Moldovan leadership back then, the, the, those who were in power, the Communist Party, were skeptical of Eastern Partnership. Uh, the pro-European opposition was uh, much more encouraged. But the, the bottom line, the underpinning of this skepticism was this philosophical debate, if you will, about Eastern Partnership, whether it is a waiting room for the European Union or it is a buffer zone between the European Union and Russia. And there is still no answer to this, to this question. It, it depends who you ask. Some people who are more Euro-optimist, if you will, from within these countries and in Brussels, will tell you that it is a waiting room. If you do everything right, if you do everything by the book, and the book being the association agreement, then you do have a chance to become a member of the EU in the near future, not so near future. Whereas others will tell you that, well, they won't really tell you in this blatant way, but you get the idea that it's more of a buffer zone. And of course, the latest developments with regards to the EU, um, not being particularly forthcoming with the Western Balkans countries, 
uh, this builds more to the argument that Eastern Partnership is more of a buffer zone, given that even the uh, uh, Albania and North Macedonia uh, were denied uh, the membership perspective for now. And this perspective is fundamental for the reforms process in these countries. Of course, one would argue that the reforms, the political elites need to do the reforms for their voters, for the country. But then the political reality kicks into place and the experience of Moldova is perhaps the most eloquent, I should say. I, I was going to use uh, disappointing, uh, but eloquent is a better way to, to point it out. In 2014, Moldova was indeed the front runner. It was the first to uh, get visa-free regime. It was a front runner in negotiating the association agreement. But then by the end of the year, now the infamous billion dollar scandal kicked in. And the question is why? Why would the political elites take such a risk given that they were on track, they were the front runners of joining the, the EU? Well, there could be two explanations. One, cynical explanation, now having run out of carrots, the political elites saw no, no better outcome for them than just to exploit the, the situation uh, and give in to the temptation that is always there and to basically rent, seek and, and uh, uh, strip assets from the, from the state-owned banks and from the national bank, given that they understood that there is no path to EU membership for them, perhaps. The other uh, analysis is that some actors, internal or external, seeing this development happening, Moldova's exports being more and more anchored towards the European market, and Moldova becoming increasingly Europeanized, albeit mostly in a formal way and not in the real uh, Europeanization of, of, of the uh, legal sphere, national bureaucracy. Uh, so some actors from within the country and from outside the country perhaps might have wanted to exploit these vulnerabilities of the country. And the, one of the largest vulnerabilities of Moldova is corruption. Transnistria is obviously one that is, goes without saying, but endemic corruption in the country is perhaps the largest national security vulnerability, if you will. And one, one avenue of exploit, or explaining this derailing and backsliding that happened in Moldova after signing the cessation agreement and after getting the visa-free regime and after getting hundreds and hundreds of millions of euros uh, for reforms in the country, it all went downhill because you've had, or one argument is that you've had this influx of uh, uh, Russian money that was laundered through Moldova According to some accounts, 20 billion, some even go as high as saying there was 70 billion. Uh, and this, of course, cannot go without repercussions in the, in the, in the uh, national political establishment. That derailed the fragile political stability that we had. And now, just yesterday, we've had yet another government fall and another government uh, being voted in place. The seventh government in Moldova in the last seven years. These are Italian numbers. Uh, the problem is that we don't have the Italian GDP and we don't, we don't have the Italian welfare system. Uh, in a country like Moldova, we don't have the luxury to have this kind of political instability. But nonetheless, we are faced with it. And uh, perhaps one of the reasons is that Eastern Partnership does not provide this clear avenue, this pathway towards membership. We understand, we are rational people, we understand that the political reality within the EU is not conducive towards membership. But perhaps some sort of a different agenda that would differentiate between Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine on the one hand, and uh, Armenia, well Armenia has changed, we are now uh, at least half a year ago, we are envious of Armenia. Uh, and Azerbaijan and Belarus is a whole different story. Uh, unless there is some differentiation and here we have our good friend, Mr. Kubilius, and our Lithuanian friends who are putting forward this agenda. Because without sort of the light at the end of the tunnel, which indicates towards these countries being indeed a waiting room and not a buffer zone, the political reality is unlikely to change, particularly in Moldova. 
Because in Ukraine, luckily, now you have a government which has absolute majority in parliament, for better or worse. In Georgia, you have the same thing, for better or worse. In Moldova, you are unlikely to have that. And this is another major vulnerability that can be exploited. So unless these countries are firmly anchored, not just economically, but also politically, onto the European integration agenda, so that this path becomes indeed irreversible, because you'll hear from politicians from all of these countries, some say that it is irreversible, some will argue, argue that it is quite indeed reversible, and they would argue in favor of actually reversing it. To a lesser extent in, in Georgia and Ukraine, luckily, not so much in Moldova. So unless there is clear differentiation, and it, it is possible, it can be done, and, and Mr. Kubilius has, has a quite a forward-looking agenda, and we hope that uh, our friends in EPP and, and, and the majority in the European Parliament and European Commission takes this forward, because there is a pathway to differentiate between these countries and to anchor them increasingly more onto the European agenda with the digital market, with infrastructure, uh, with transportation projects, with uh, uh, support for media, civil society, but also economically. Uh, now Moldova exports 70% to EU, Transnistria exports more to the EU than it does to Russia or to the CIS. Uh, but the economics and economic underpinnings are not enough to shift the political perspective and the reality on the ground. And also from a security perspective, there also needs to be uh, an agenda that will, again, anchor these countries uh, in the uh, European and Euro-Atlantic. In, in Moldova, it's less fashionable to talk about Euro-Atlantic uh, integration than it is in Georgia and in Ukraine. Uh, but unless these countries start perceiving themselves as being indeed in the waiting room of the EU, and there is an agenda that underpins this perception, then these countries indeed have a chance to reform, because reforms are incredibly painful. And we're seeing now with the justice reform, which is very much stalling in Moldova. It is struggling in Ukraine. One would argue that there is backsliding in Georgia, at least one would argue cynically that at least it's better to have backsliding from a sort of high level, uh, whereas in Moldova there is nothing to backslide from. We haven't even reached a point uh, in, in justice reform where we can backslide from. We, are, we were only trying, we were planting the first seeds in the last five months that we had this very forward-looking reform-oriented government with all the support from the European Union available. But nonetheless, given the uh, political realities in Moldova, this government uh, was voted down, but the majority of the public still remain pro-European, and that is the most important. Unfortunately, this is also cannot and should not be taken for granted, because in 2009, when the Eastern Partnership was launched, 73% of Moldovan voters were in favor of Euro European integration. After the billion dollar scandal that I mentioned uh, above, and m many of you might be familiar with it, uh, in 2015, only 35% of Moldovan voters were in favor of European integration, because it just so happens that it was the so-called Alliance for European Integration in Power when the scandal happened. So the association was sort of direct, and unfairly, EU took a huge uh, image blow to, to its perception in Moldova. But now things have sort of uh, uh, come back. But this staunch position and principled position from the European Union and this uh, generous support from the European Union will only strengthen the uh, support among the Moldovan voters and will force, if you will, uh, the Moldovan political class to increasingly perceive this track as being indeed irreversible. Because economically it is, it now just remains to also have it politically irreversible. And this agenda that uh, uh, Mr. Kubilius will perhaps uh, provide more details, which we'll, we full-heartedly support, uh, to create the premise to increasingly integrate uh, these three countries, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, into the various uh, sectors of the European common market without necessarily yet having uh, the 
membership perspective. Of course, membership perspective would make it much easier. It would, it would be this uh, holy grail, if you will, uh, metaphorically speaking. But step-by-step -step integration, where it matters to, to the ordinary citizens, to young people, whether it's reducing roaming charges, increasing mobility for business, for young people, uh, this is tangible outcomes that will change the reality of the, on the ground in a sort of stealthy mode, uh, hopefully. Uh, so we, we indeed support this differentiation between uh, the three, uh, between these six uh, Eastern Partnership countries, between those three countries that have achieved more. And this is very much in line with the principle voiced by the European Union all these years, more for more. So if these countries are indeed doing more, albeit they could have done even more, uh, but they need to be encouraged and the differentiation needs to take place because otherwise, uh, for the political elites in Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, but also for the ordinary voters, uh, there is a risk that Eastern Partnership may be perceived as a buffer zone and not the waiting room, which uh, would be a much more positive perspective of the Eastern Partnership. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for such open and illuminating remarks and showing basically linking the domestic dynamics with the sort of European agenda and this demand for engagement but also for differentiation. Um, so we've got this sort of demand from the region and now it's up to Mr. Kubilius to basically come up with the solution to this conundrum. Well, uh, thanks a lot, really. Mikhail explained a lot of uh, things uh, and we had a chance recently to have uh, to, to we participate in a seminar somewhere in the north in Visby Island, you know, uh, in in Gotland Island in Visby City, and uh, so we are talking almost the same language on <laughs> on those issues. So uh, as you mentioned very very clearly, so there is demand from uh, uh, at least three or countries, you know, for some kind of steps forward from EU side. So we know what those countries want. Do we know what EU wants? It's, for me, it's still, uh, as a newcomer into European Parliament, it's still not very clear. And that is, I think, this is an issue. So on Tuesday, we launched an uh, informal forum in European Parliament. We had really good gathering. We had experts who are even here, you know. We had institutions. And I see my role as Euronest president, co-chair of uh, Euronest, also to create in some way venue to have much more discussions inside of the parliament. Not only formal discussions in AFED, but also informal discussions, you know, experts, uh, country representatives, you know, members of European parliament, just to keep uh, Eastern partnership issue and, and uh, country issues, you know, like Moldova, like Ukraine, high on agenda. Because my first feeling was when I came into European Parliament was a little bit, you know, I was a little bit uh, worried that uh, topic is going down. Then we became a little bit more positive and optimistic when we saw several uh, important resolutions which were voted with huge majority and uh, resolutions on, 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 the, on important topics like Ukrainian political prisoners in, in Russia, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, 80 years, you know. So we see that environment is good, climate is good, but we need to come with clear ideas, with clear, clear strategies to discuss and to have European Parliament really uh, able to take some leadership, political leadership, in development of Eastern Partnership policy. Because I see really that we are very happy, we are very, very good in, in going very quickly into some kind of technical details. And we're losing uh, something what I would call, you know, political horizon, you know, political messages, which are absolutely, I agree with Mikhail, they are absolutely important. We, we cannot forget what I call soft power of EU, which comes from political language, not just from, you know, technical or economical, you know, uh, details. So, you know, being in the same politics since the very beginning, since 1990s, I remember how effective was this soft power of EU in keeping us on track with all the reforms, in keeping our motivation for reforms, when we were making also, you know, uh, political house like, like, you know, 
Moldova or, or as you know, Eastern Partnership countries are able to do. All of us, and at that stage of development, we were in a very similar situation. Luckily, in 1993, after we lost, you now I am from party of uh, our first president, Landsberg, you know, we, we voted, we brought, you know, Saudis, I see Al Alvedas Medelinskas, you know, we won elections in 1990, we brought independence in 1992, after independence was recognized, parliament split, which is again very natural. We were, you know, we went for extraordinary elections, being absolutely sure that people will vote for us because we brought independence. People voted against us. People voted for former Communist Party, which was, you know, for us it was total shock how it can happen. Luckily, next, you know, uh, there were elections in Poland and people voted against Bolsarovich reforms. So in that, in that stage, after revolution, you can be very pro-reformistic or you can be stagnant. People are, you know, they were, they were expecting miracle, miracle did not happen, you know, they are voting out. So luckily in 1993, EU was brave enough to announce Copenhagen criteria, and we understood that this is our way. Then politics was going, you know, from one side to another side, but we were keeping us on track because we saw that we can reach that goal. We saw this, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And differentiation was, again, very important because in Lithuania, Always, when I was Prime Minister, I always was declaring that my, my agenda is very simple. To become better, Lithuania needs to become better than Estonia. And that's all, you know. And because Estonia was always in front of us, you know, in negotiations, so that was, you know, that was very, very strong, you know. And I am joking, but that was reality, you know. That was real. So that's why, why you know, we see, we see really, I, I, again, I agree with, with with, with uh, Mikhail, what, what is important is political language, political messages from EU side. Then we need to understand really, I think that in EU still we are in some way, how to say, hesitant to understand really what we want in this region. I think that uh, Commissioner, now he's, he's sending uh, his mandate, Johannes Gan, was very good in explaining in a very simple way what should be EU strategic goal. He said, for you it's better to export stability than to import instability. Perfect language. The question is very simple. What kind of instruments EU has in order to export stability into neighboring regions? And if you look you know, into the whole history of European continent after the Second World War, and especially after Berlin Wall, you know, collapsed, you will not see any individual country which came out from totalitarian regime and was, you know, a post-totalitarian country, that this country on its own would be able to improve itself, to stabilize itself, to become, you know, perfect democracy, economically, you know, uh, well-developing and so on and so on. The only one instrument which helps countries to overcome all the, you know, challenges of post-totalitarian, you know, um, period is, of course, EU promise of enlargement. Nothing else. What we have in this region, still no promise from EU side. Why? I think not because those countries are very bad, weak, corrupted, oligarchic, or whatever. When the country is you know, in, in need, when the country is in, in problem, our assistance is even more needed. If Moldova would be a nice and perfect country, we would not speak about you know, <laughs> any kind of EU new instruments. Why, why EU is not providing? membership perspective, not because of EU enlargement fatigue. We need to be very clear. It's because of geopolitics. It's because of Russia standing next, you know, to this region. And there are always, when we're talking in big capitals, there are very simple language at the end. We don't want to provoke Putin. That's the problem. And if you will read Macron, interesting, uh, interview in Economist, you will see the same language again. 
So that's, that's the issue, that's the problem. But I hope that things can change slowly, but things can change and the European Parliament can, can really be of importance. Changing attitude, changing geopolitical attitude. I liked very much Ursula von der Leyen's statement that new commission will be geopolitical. And even more, I liked what Joseph Borrell was speaking when he was going through the hearing. I was, before the hearing, I was worried. Spanish representative, socialist for me, from EPP, it's immediately, you know, some suspicious. But he, he spoke exactly the language which we are speaking about. Uh, first of all, that if EU wants to be globally geopolitically important, first of all, EU needs to be effective in its neighborhood. And on Russia, he said again, strategy which we are speaking about, what should be EU strategy towards Russia, first of all, to build a belt of successful countries next to Russia, starting from Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. So that's, that's what we, I see, I see, you know, signals that EU can come with much more clear vision what EU wants in that region. That's, that's good. Now, you know, what we are proposing, uh, very simple, uh, Mikhail told, you know, it's nothing, nothing very special. Differentiation should be real, not just, you know, talking more for more, less for less, but real differentiation. I think the time is, 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 is to make this differentiation, you know, uh, visible. And that would be this EU language towards those countries which are uh, three advanced countries. Yes, you are advanced, and we, on the EU side, we are moving forward also. We are not staying on the same level. What we are proposing, well, if, you to, if, to, if to use that language, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, we cannot promise for time being light. But what we are trying to show, tunnel. <laughs> Of course, tunnel maybe uh, sounds not very, <laughs> not very, not very optimistically, but you know, you always can expect that if you are going into the tunnel, that at the end of the tunnel, here will be the light. So what we are trying to propose, not only differentiation, trio strategy, like like you know, special strategy for trio countries, but also we are trying to uh, show, you know, possibility to use some instruments parallel to Western Balkans. And I hope that this, again, can be a soft, soft uh, you know, power message. Look, in Eastern Partnership, EU is starting to use some instruments which are used for Western Balkans. So Western Balkans has the light of the, uh, at the end of the tunnel. They have membership perspective. So we are, <laughs> we are not promising the light, but we are saying, look, let's go the same tunnel. Perhaps here will be the light at the end of the tunnel. So what we are trying to... to, to, to to uh, what we're trying to borrow from Western Balkans uh, is, uh, again, nothing very, very special. Uh, we think that what was done by German government back in 2014 for Western Balkans with creation of Berlin process could be a could be good instrument to use also for Eastern partnership uh, for, for three of countries. And most important is really to create a proper leadership arrangement inside of EU. Because Berlin process, what, he, what, what, it, uh, what it was, it was creation of coalition inside of EU of like-minded countries, members of EU, in order to push forward, you know, uh, Western Balkans integration agenda. So we are proposing also to have some kind of coalition of like-minded countries who has special interest towards Eastern Partnership region, of course, Central Europe, Baltics, you know, Germany, maybe Nordic countries, and especially we are looking into those countries which will be in the presidencies of EU till 2030, starting from Croatia next year. Next week we shall be in Zagreb in EPP Congress. We shall have a resolution with the same language which we, uh, on trio, trio, trio strategy, we put that resolution. But also we shall speak with Prime Minister Plenkovic and, and other people uh, you know, to, lo to look what, what uh, Croatian presidency can, can, can give, we, especially with the e e Eastern Partnership Summit in, in June. Then here will be Germany in the presidency. We talked with Berlin uh, people and, and uh, we saw some interest, but well, we shall see. 
I think that again, what we were trying to talk with in Berlin, we were trying to talk very, very special language that we need to take care about Angela Merkel legacy in Eastern Partnership Policy because that will be the last uh, presidency of German government when Angela Merkel will be uh, chancellor of the government. So Berlin process for Eastern Partnership countries, Berlin process, Berlin uh, process, you know, too, could be a very good, you know, legacy monument to Angela Merkel. Uh, then after that, here will be Czech Republic in 2022, France, which is, again, special, yeah, special target of our uh, lobbying efforts. Uh, also in 2022, then Sweden 2023, then Poland 2025, Lithuania 2027, and Latvia 2028. If we would have, you know, not only coalition, but some kind of, you know, shared agenda and synergy among those presidencies, so I hope that this next decade can be really quite, quite a, a promising, resultative, you know, and, and that is what we're trying to do. So we shall be active, both in the parliament and in Euronest and, uh, and, 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 and uh, somewhere, somewhere in big capitals, really pushing Eastern Partnership agenda as most serious geopolitical agenda on European continent. Because at the end, again, we are talking also about, about our strategy towards Russia. I disagree with President Macron when he says that you know, it's existential need for Europe to bring back Russia with Putin and all his regime you know, into some kind of friendship. I think that Europe needs to take different approach. Europe needs to have a strategy towards Russia, long-term strategy, but that strategy should be targeted towards how to assist Russia to transform itself back to normal democratic and European type country. And uh, one instrument which can, you know, the West use in order to achieve that goal is again success of Ukraine, success of Eastern partnership countries. That can make a very big uh, influence on all the Russian people, you know, in order for them to ask themselves very, very simple questions, why Ukraine is becoming successful, European, you know, integrated country, and Russians are still, you know, somewhere. So that's, that's our vision. We can do some kind of, you know, job during the next decade. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm in a very sort of a comfortable morally position because I absolutely, I'm delighted with the demand side and the replies, sort of um, supply side, the discussion. Plenty of um, things to think through. So we have a bit of, obviously, we are, uh, there's lunch pressure over us as well as uh, the wrap-up session. So we have a short sort of, uh, we'll just have a short round of questions, comments, responses, ideas. So um, anybody who would like to kick off the discussion. We have two uh, voices to start with. Let's start with the right hand side. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. Uh, my name is Hanna Bazila. I'm from European Union Advisory Mission. I uh, formerly worked uh, with Andrei Plenkovich in the European Parliament. And uh, congratulations on assuming the role of Euronest co-chair. It's uh, extremely important. And uh, this uh, forum, I mean, today we've been discussing um, how to bring these countries together. And Euronest is one of the platform where this challenge has to be taken on board. And it's very um, good to hear that you are willing to take this uh, discussions in the parliament um, further on. I have lots of questions of, uh, like, uh, from your speech, um, but I would like to focus on a couple of them. First of all, um, I would like to uh, ask for your opinion about the new Eastern, uh, new commissioner for enlargement, uh, how the EP hearings were going on, what were the questions, can you give us some ideas on what is the in discussions in the parliament about the uh, new commissioner? 
Uh, and second of all, you mentioned that you organized this uh, dialogue last week uh, um, with other institutions. So this, uh, we speak about the importance of uh, parliament-government cooperation, but in the European Union it's also important that uh, all three institutions, member states, commission, parliament, speak together on this uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis our countries. And uh, also at the beginning of the forum, um, our deputy prime minister spoke about the strategy, EU strategy, strategy for Eastern Partnership, uh, three association countries. So do you think it's possible, uh, are there any discussions that the European Union will present and its institutions will work together to present this strategy specifically for the associated countries? Thank you very much. Thank you. We have as many as, I think, three questions here. So our second... Um, the, it's over there this time, sorry. Thank you very much. Very short question. I'm Dan Szyligowski from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. So question is addressed to our Prime Minister Kubilius. Which countries would you like to see in this group, in this Berlin process, and whom would you see as a leader of this process? <laughs> Maybe, okay. could you elaborate a bit more on that? <laughs> okay, thank you. That was a short and snappy question. So uh, the third question now. Well, I am very glad so my countryman, uh, uh, Andrew Skubilius, made such a visionary uh, presentation. Because to my understanding also, I'm from Lithuania, political analyst from Lithuania. Thank you, Andrew, for reminding our struggle for independence to get away out of uh, Russian influence. And I think those countries, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, as they're doing now, are this issue. So it's, uh, to my understanding also, the Eastern Partnership is also not only the question about technicalities, but also about a vision, about a geopolitical perspective. So I would like to ask you one question. You mentioned that you uh, became more optimistic uh, looking what the situation in the European Parliament. Are you also optimistic that you could change the opinion of some EU major countries? And let's say uh, some people maybe in the Commission that it's a partnership, it's really not a technicality, but first of all, you have to say that how it's important, strategically important for the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have um, a set of questions and comments. So let's start with Mr. Kubilius, but um, Mr. Popson, perhaps you'd like to contribute as well. Yeah, okay. Oh, in a very brief way, on commission, uh, a Hungarian one, still I do not remember uh, you know, his, his name, quite difficult to pronounce. Uh, as you know, he was still not approved according to the procedures. He got some questions, additional questions from the committees, uh, from the committee members. Uh, if then it can go in in uh, in different way. If then uh, uh, committee chairpersons from different parties, if they will uh, agree with his answers, so it will be done next week. Or if not, then we shall have another hearing, and so on and so on. So still not 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 very clear. Uh, first of all, of course. Most of questions were to him not about his view towards Eastern Partnership or Western Balkans, but about his view towards Prime Minister Orban. Uh, you know that he was, till now, he was serving as ambassador to EU and so on and so on. And, and uh, uh, in some way, some political groups really put this as most important questions. So I don't know how, how things will, 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 will go. On, uh, on his language on uh, enlargement, on Western Balkans, he spoke quite, quite, quite a lot. On Eastern partnership was not bad. Maybe, uh, maybe I, uh, I was feeling lack of some kind of this uh, political visionary language, which Joseph Borrell was very good in, in delivering. So we were comparing, you know, commissioner with Borrell, not, not with other commissioners, but with Borrell. So uh, that was a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, disadvantaged to him that before that we were listening to Borrell, and Borrell was really very, very well outspoken about, about geopolitics. So I hope that, well, uh, now the question is really, we are concerned more about uh, commission 
ability to start work as quickly as possible than about individual individual commissioners. So I hope that things will will go. Now on uh, on EU strategy, yes, we know we are in in, in good good contacts with with. Uh, uh, with uh, Vice Prime Minister Kuleba, with Minister um, Pristaiko, we exchange our views, we send our our papers. We are happy that we hear some some similar language on on trio on advanced countries, associated countries. Uh, so I, I hope that this this will become uh, really a new politics of EU, new policy policy language. But, well, it can be uh, adopted through the whole process, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. Before that, here will be a special hearing in the uh, European Parliament, in AFET. Uh, here will be reports. We shall do our activities. We are planning to organize a bigger conference, you know, on Euronest, uh, using Euronest as a platform and our forum, which we established. Uh, to have bigger conference before hearings in, in Parliament. And of course, we are planning also some activities in, in at least in bigger capitals of EU, especially a little bit far away, you know, far distance from, from, from here, like Madrid or Rome, because we understand that, you know, uh, there is much more of understanding about Eastern Partnership in closer to this region and much less of understanding in, in South as we have less of understanding about Mediterranean, and I started to dream about uh, joint uh, meetings of Euronest and Euromed, you know, <laughs> just to, to, to show that, you know, all of us, we have problems, but in different regions, we know uh, in a different way about those problems. So for us, it would be very good to exchange our views on, on those problems. On, uh, on who can take the leadership, in this what we call coalition. Of course, it will depend. Well, I don't know if Berlin process has really some, uh, some country who is taking the leadership. We need to look more deeply. It's a title who, uh, who is, you know, Berlin process has a title which shows that Berlin should be in the leadership. Why not to have a Warsaw process for Eastern Partnership or Warsaw Vilnius or I don't know, whatever, you know. When I was traveling with, uh, uh, in, in, uh, earlier, we were, you know, I don't know how much you knew about this, our initiative, Marshall Plan for Ukraine, uh, starting from 2017, we saw that titles are very important. And uh, we, we were quite surprised that in Berlin, for example, we have had reluctance to use this Marshall Plan language. The same in Paris. So in Berlin, we promised that we can call it Merkel Plan for Ukraine, in Paris, we said that we can call it Macron plan for Ukraine, <laughs> just in order. <laughs> so that's on leadership. And the last one on, on Alvedas Medolinska's question. Well, I think that, you know, of course we understand that there are countries which are a little more reluctant to, to push forward that agenda. But I think that what, what is missing, from my point of view, that till now, there are no proper discussions with those countries. So we, what we are looking, I don't know how much you know, European Parliament can do it or, or political parties can do it, you know, EPP and, and, and liberals and socialists, you know. We're trying to look uh, for possibilities to have good seminars, for example, in, in, in Paris, in Madrid, in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, you know, in Rome, just to discuss, you know, how we see the whole issue, how they see, you know, issues, why they are reluctant in some way. Let's discuss. No, no, it's, it's really a shortage of those discussions which I think we, we need to overcome. And especially I'm very happy that in EPP, perhaps next week, we shall have new president of EPP, and it will be Donald Tusk. With all his experience, I hope that we shall be really very good in pushing, and because we were prime ministers at the same time, you know, so I know him very well, so we shall make <laughs> lobbying, you know, more effective. Yeah, Mikhail?
thank you so much for actually um, being so explicit, but we are talking about political issues, and I would like just to add to our Moldovan speaker a sub-question of the role, perhaps Moldova is in a very sort of special position of having being Romanian member of um, European Parliament. And Romania, at least as other MEPs commented, has was a double-edged sword, with the socialists actually monopolizing almost the Moldovan agenda. Many other MEPs uh, felt that actually dealing with Moldova was more difficult because of the Romanian agenda. So it's an opportunity, but also it can be a bit of sort of weakening point. So perhaps, you know, responding to this discussion with the experience of the previous European Parliament. I'll provide a few brief remarks with regards to the previous questions. The question of who should be the leader, well, that's obvious. As a Moldovan, I cannot say anything else other than Moldova should be a leader and as a politician. But as an academic and, and as an honest person, I must admit that this is possible, but given our political reality, this is, uh, this is unlikely. But I and my party will work diligently to make Moldova a leader in the Eastern Partnership, to reclaim this, this mantle, but also more importantly, to maintain this mantle in a sustainable way and not just become a leader and then drop, backslide, and then hope to become a leader again. Uh, now, with regards to the question with the geostrategic importance of uh, Eastern Partnership and uh, the understanding of, uh, of uh, EU countries of the importance of the Eastern Partnership, well, from how I see it from, from Moldova, this is indeed a very important region, but it's very difficult to convince uh, Ireland or even Portugal of the, of the importance of this region. But nonetheless, uh, there are enough countries that can be persuaded and many don't even need to be persuaded like the Baltic states, Poland and Sweden and it's up to those countries to uh, become this indeed uh, circle of friends that will promote the interest and will try to explain the importance to, to, to their fellow colleagues. The, and the perspective of how to deal with the region from a, from a geopolitical perspective it, it's probably binary, it, it, it could be more than two options, but basically it's either you engage in this geopolitical tug of war with Russia, and that is problematic, to say the least, for the EU, both politically and militarily. EU is, for many reasons, not a match to, 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 to Russia. But what EU is, um, where EU is a match to Russia, it's obviously economically, but also in terms of soft power. The attractiveness of the EU beats Russia uh, fair and square. So the approach where you integrate these countries from an economic perspective, from a cultural perspective, from social perspective, uh, thus engaging in a sort of stealthy uh, integration of these countries to antagonize Russia more, uh, less, and this is the recipe for success because when you antagonize Russia more, uh, it's these countries that suffer first and foremost. It's like in the metaphor with the elephants fighting, it's the grass that suffers. So in, 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 uh, in antagonizing Russia, political instability in these countries will only increase and the reforms process, the reform process in justice sector, uh, uh, reducing vulnerabilities with regards to corruption and national security aspects, there is no prospects for meaningful reforms when you have political instability uh, and, and Russia obviously has a lot of uh, avenues to create political instability. Uh, now, uh, with uh, uh, regards to, uh, uh, please remind me, Romania. the Romanian, well, yeah, how can you forget Romania? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite, quite a, a funny story, actually. When we go to Brussels uh, and we talk to members of the European Parliament who are not Romanian, they do, have, they do voice this frustration that when it comes to the topic of Moldova, uh, plenary debates or in, uh, committee debates, then it so happens that the partisan debate from within Moldovan Parliament is juxtaposed over the... Over whatever is happening in the European Parliament, and the left and the right, EPP and the Social Democrats, 
engage in this sort of partisan bickering, which creates a frustration among the rest of MEPs who take this debate as being just partisan, and sort of it's easier for them to stand back and say, you know, let them sort it out, it's not worth engaging. And this is unfortunate because, I mean, of course, call me biased because I'm a member of EPP, uh, but there are real arguments there. Because when you say that our good friends uh, from the socialist or democratic party are corrupt, there is state capture, there is an oligarchic regime, those are facts. But when they are perceived through a political lens, through a partisan lens in the European Parliament, those arguments are easier to be disregarded from, from this pure partisan perspective. And that is unfortunate. But of course, we shouldn't complain because we are quite in an advantageous position having Romania such a close ally being a member of the EU and uh, uh, having such a close partnership with the European MEPs, primarily from, from the center right. Uh, this is a huge advantage to Moldova. It's just a matter of how we can capitalize of that advantage. And uh, that, there we can still work on. That's great. Thank you so much for this very illuminating and sort of forward-looking, but also rather political uh, panel and sort of inspiring us to think big, but also not only at technical issues, but the tunnel and light, the metaphor is not going to go away, but also mentioning our perpetual white elephant in the room, i.e. Russia. So sort of uh, quite... Um, complex picture. Now I think it's time for a wrap up. We've worked very hard, so it's over to uh, Dmitro to finalize the forum. Well, uh, maybe I will not finalize it yet, but uh, I will just would like to share with you some uh, comments. Uh, observations from my side, uh, because this is indeed the third uh, accession exchange forum. This is the end of it. Uh, and uh, I really uh, uh, think that looking comparatively, uh, comparing this third accession exchange forum with the previous two, I think we have change uh, in the context, we have change in uh, the debate, uh, and we have changed in the focus a little bit. I think that, uh, well, obvious context change is the political turmoil in most of the well, probably in all the countries which we're uh, talking about. Uh, previous forums were, I would say, much more stable. <laughs> uh, it was pretty far ahead known who would come from the governments. Now we have situation when some people come from the governments and say, I'm coming back, already being not part of the government. Uh, so uh, it's really a more dynamic context which we're you know, discuss. Second, uh, a very interesting, I think that there is a kind of change in the debate, and maybe even kind of more hot debate, I would say, which we have experienced, uh, maybe because we have more, uh, bigger variety of uh, perspectives and voices from the EU represented here at this third association exchange forum. And I've seen that, uh, uh, there is a, in my perception, there is, we, we have seen during these debates in the th three, three days, we've seen some sort of clash of the discourses. I would say the kind of more optimistic and more skeptical one. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of, especially official EU representatives saying that 10 years ago, nobody would predict how far we could go, we could go with so much progress achieved in 10 years. Frankly speaking, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm already so old, but I remember I remember 15 years ago, Romana Prodi's promise of everything but institutions. So I knew what I, I remember what was promised 15 years ago. I stake it at the internal market and uh, everything but institutions. Now we are talking that, well, uh, there is no appetite for further, basically no, for, for, for nothing. Just uh, in best way, incremental change. Um, maybe business as usual, this is the best way. And uh, 
that's really uh, and, and even more. I would say that kind of when we say when we talk about okay, if not membership perspective, uh, somehow in the third day we mentioned and started to debate membership perspective again. But I think that mostly the debate was pragmatic, so understanding that it is not something which is on short uh, offer, but. Uh, where we are talking rather about de facto membership and kind of exploring the ideas of European, uh, European economic area or other possible options and talking about integration to internal uh, single market. But then uh, kind of the skeptical discourse which we observe is basically, well, you need to do your homework. It's European standards which are the best ones, so you need to do it for yourself. You basically need to implement association agreements. And this is really striking to me that if, I mean, I, I clearly see that those people who promote this discourse, they don't understand what is association agreement. Because they read only one part of it. They only read the homework part of it. And association agreement is not homework plan. Because if it's, if it's only, where only homework plan for our countries, then we would not need association agreement, a legally binding bilateral agreement with the European Union. I mean, if, just to do a homework, it's just, okay, we have a homework plan and unilaterally implement it. No, association agreement is about bilateral obligations. And if we implement homework, homework we have particular uh, things which were offered by the European Union, which European Union obliged to do. Like, for instance, ACA agreement. Very clear the statement. But then now we see that, we hear that, well, maybe it was not really promised, and we don't know. So that's really very interesting uh, to, to, to discuss and to understand that sometimes it's not only about uh, explaining the content of association agreement and nature of our relationship to our countries and politicians and citizens, but also to uh, many EU capitals and uh, EU representatives. And finally, I think that really what was uh, really interesting in this uh, endeavor, in, in this forum, is really change of focus. So we've seen that because of the political turmoil uh, in our countries, because of this reluctance of the EU to come up with a vision, we need to mobilize ourselves. And we need to, I mean, we, uh, those people who think about it, and especially the civil society people who gathered here and representing the civil society platforms in the three countries. So uh, this is really uh, the first time which we were able to come up with this joint position. And really, again, uh, thank you all those who were uh, uh, taking part in it and uh, re very quickly being able to agree on uh, basically that we share basically the same vision. So this, uh, this declaration which we presented in the very beginning of the forum, I wanted all, again to share with uh, Mr. Kubilius and uh, uh, Mr. Popsoy, and uh, this is our call for the uh, official representatives of the three countries to work more closely together. Uh, this is also our uh, wish to, and our intention to cooperate among ourselves, among civil society. Uh, among, civil, uh, among the platforms and broadly speaking. And uh, uh, this is again and again, it's not about destroying Eastern partnership, it's about adding more advanced track of it. And uh, I think that in, in this political turbulence times, it's actually time for us to be more active, for civil society people uh, from the three countries to be more active because we understand that probably our governments will be, in the short term, not very active uh, on, on this stage, but hopefully it will change, and we need to do it, and European Union uh, also should change its position and be more proactive. I, finally, I remember the uh, words of also one of the messages of uh, 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 Vice Prime Minister Kuleba when he was opening the forum that uh, if uh, EU uh, wants to be a global player, it needs to be bigger. So I really uh, appreciate our distinguished speakers' messages that really we need to we really, really need to think in these terms. Uh, in the global world, it seems like European Union is becoming smaller. Europe is becoming smaller. So we three countries have uh, have the ability to add value to for for Europe to be more bigger and to be more uh, influential. Thank you very much. And uh, 
actually that's so much from my because I really was provoked by the quality of the discussions. Uh, I wanted so much to say and could be, could could tell more, but from my observations. But uh, the ultimate question for us, of course, is uh, to what we are doing after this forum. We obviously we need to remain in contact and in, in more uh, engage in more structured, more structured, more active communication among ourselves. But uh, what concretely could be done if if somebody just want uh, wants to raise some ideas, uh, concrete ideas, what 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 can be done in short term in near I don't know months. Please just raise your hand. Maybe we have some. How much we have before lunch? Five minutes. <laughs> okay. So just uh, we, we can of course then uh, discuss much more during lunch. But maybe now someone who wants to do it in public, please raise your hands. Um, <clears throat> the idea of going the whole way with Andreas's uh, analogy to the Balkan Berlin plus um, that that uh, encounters. Uh, skepticism on the part of uh, some of the so-called leading member states. <coughs> However, <coughs> um, it seems to me that from our discussion of these last two and a half days that, <coughs> as Dimitro is suggesting, the idea of this, this three, this trio, trio language seems to stick. If this trio begins to get their act together um, like you are suggesting, um, that is something <coughs> which I, as an observer of the EU, would say uh, this would not be an initiative of the EU, but the EU would, be, uh, would have to respond positively to it, because the EU likes regional and sub-regional integration in general. It's part of their religion. Um, <coughs> and um, so don't ask them to promote the initiative. Do it, and I think you would get... Um, um, a positive response. Now, in the more concrete terms, how might this work? I hope very much that <coughs> the EU funding will continue. I don't know anything about your, your funding, but anyway, I hope that your initiative can continue to a, a fourth and fifth, etc., association exchange forum. But what you might envisage for next year is that you might have a, a two-part event <coughs> in which uh, the three governments uh, might get together and have an official working session on common interests, um, back to back, then followed with a session rather like this one, which would be uh, a mixed event. This might help slide into uh, an officialization uh, of the process. Thank you. Since the question is asked, what, what to do next? Um, just to echo to what Mr. Kubilius said about uh, forthcoming process, uh, meetings, he said, in a number of capitals across uh, Europe. Uh, well, certainly uh, what I think you have in mind is to uh, advocate for, for what is being proposed. And since it very much echoes to what we have been developing from the part of expert community or civil uh, uh, society, uh, would not you think that uh, we somehow, one way or other, should be involved in that kind of process? And if yes, uh, 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 then uh, we should be looking forward uh, for the, look for the ways, you know, how to do that. Uh, on the other hand, or second, uh, for instance, when it comes to the Georgian reality, uh, of course, those uh, who pretend uh, are you know, well established in the Georgian uh, domestic <laughs> landscape and still have some good contacts with uh, whatever remains of the majority in the Georgian parliament or whatever remains uh, in the Georgian uh, government, perhaps we could be a good asset for that purpose, you know, to promote uh, this idea. Um, yeah. And there could be a number of uh, ways how to proceed. Thank you. So should we go for lunch to have some more powerful and more energy to discuss all these things and uh, ex uh, exchange our impressions and ideas?
So thank you very much again for coming to Kiev and thank you for your attention and uh, until hopefully until the next forum. <laughs>